well, um, for today, whoops, for today, there are um, two subjects that I'd like to talk about. Uh, so uh, first to give you a brief summary of Anzager theory, and then to move on to uh, an introduction to elasticity of, uh, of pneumatic liquid crystals. So let's get to these things. Uh, first, with uh, Anzager theory, um, this is a, a different microscopic theory that can be compared with Myers Alpha. Right, so Myers Alpha is one kind of microscopic theory that makes uh, one set of assumptions about what are the interactions between molecules in a pneumatic liquid crystal. Uh, Anzager theory makes a different set of assumptions. Uh, Anzager theory assumes that we have many uh, hard uh, rods, that is, cylindrical particles in solution, and uh, these rods uh, you know, have, have a structure uh, like this, some length L, a diameter D. Um, they are uh, rigid, they cannot bend. Um, and the only interaction between the rods uh, is excluded volume. Right? So uh, we know about excluded volume interaction from um, other things that we've done this semester, like the hard spheres that could form a crystal. Right? So if for the uh, excluded volume interaction, we would say that um, if you have a rod number I interacting with rod number J, that the potential energy is zero uh, if there's no overlap and infinity if there's some overlap. So that is a way of saying that there can't possibly be any overlap, right? It would take uh, uh, an infinite amount of energy to make one uh, cylinder overlap with another cylinder. Okay, so now uh, suppose we have many cylinders like this in a solution, right? This is not um, a good approximation for a typical molecular liquid crystal like uh, 5CB, but it is a good approximation for other kinds of experiments. Right? There are other experiments where you have a lot of particles suspended in water or in another solvent. Uh, for example, you might have um, virus particles. A lot of viruses are well approximated by uh, hard, uh, rigid rods. Um, or other kinds of uh, synthetic uh, particles might be um, rod-like structures. Okay. So suppose you have many rods in solution. Um, Will there be an isotropic phase where the rods are pointing in all different directions? Or will there be a pneumatic phase where the rods are mostly aligned in some dominant direction? Okay. So um, the, the way to answer that is to um, think about this interaction. Okay, and so we would want to say, you know, if we have an interaction like this, okay, um, how much volume is excluded? And what Anzager figured out is that the amount of volume that is excluded um, depends on the relative angle between rods. So that is um, this angle theta, right, between the axis of one rod and the axis of another rod. Okay. So to illustrate this point, um, suppose we have uh, these two uh, pens representing our, our rods. 
Okay, so I will I'll, here, I'll turn off the iPad so you can see the picture bigger. Where's my? All right. So suppose you um, you have. Oops, hang on a second. Okay, suppose you have um, these uh, two pens representing rods, right? And I can try different relative angles between them. Um, what if the relative angle is 90 degrees like this? Right. In this situation, we could say, suppose I hold the black rod fixed and I move the blue rod. Right. So I can move the blue rod to lots of positions in three-dimensional space. But there's a certain set of positions where the blue rod cannot go. Right? There's a set of positions where if I try to put the blue rod, there will have to be some overlap, which is impossible. Okay, So um, I can trace out the boundary of those positions, right? There's a boundary right here. This is the boundary of the forbidden region. And then I'll trace out the boundary up there and the boundary there, and the boundary there and there. Okay, So there's also a boundary um, in the plane perpendicular to the screen, right? There's a front place where I can put the blue rod and a back place like this, okay? But in between is forbidden. Okay? So there's kind of a rectangular region. It looks like a, a, a square up here, and then uh, it uh, has some narrow width perpendicular to the screen, okay? Um, so that's the excluded region for the blue rod if the relative angle is 90 degrees. If the relative angle is more like 45 degrees, then the excluded region is different. Okay? The excluded region looks like a, a parallelogram now in two dimensions, again, with a narrow width in the third dimension. Um, if I um, make the rods parallel, that is a relative angle of zero degrees, then the excluded region is very small, right? The, um, the blue rod can go almost anywhere except for a little range of positions right in the in this middle. Okay, so um, then, um, here, I have this little Mathematica where I tried to map out the excluded region. You can just admire my beautiful Mathematica graphics here. Let's see, share. Yes, here, I made graphics where I could scan through what are all the places where I can put one rod and uh, the range of places depends on the relative angle, right? So it's a medium sized range there. But if the relative angle is 90 degrees, then there's a bigger set of positions that are uh, forbidden. Um, oh man, I worked so hard on that graphics. Let's, uh, but let's uh, skip that anyway. So um, Anzager uh, did not have Mathematica graphics, but he was. Um, really smart. And he figured out an expression for the volume of that region. Okay, so if I go back to iPad, let's see. if I go back to iPad, I can say um, Anzager's equation for how much volume is excluded um, is like this. Okay, that the excluded volume is equal to um, two times the diameter times the length squared times the absolute value of the sine of theta. Um, so uh, this is uh, an approximation um, assuming that L, the length, is much greater than the diameter D. Okay. So this equation says that the excluded volume is zero if theta equals zero. We know that's not 
exactly true, but with this approximation that the diameter is much less than the length, um, that is a, a, a good approximation okay, for, for long, thin rods. Um, you'll notice that this expression um, is proportional to the length squared times the diameter. Okay? You might guess for the volume of a cylinder, it's like the length times the diameter squared. Okay? But this is different because the dimensions involve length in two of the three dimensions and diameter only in the third dimension. So that's how the excluded volume goes. Okay, now let's connect this with what we've done for other problems that have an excluded volume in them. Okay. Um, if we think about the free energy, the free energy is the expectation value of energy minus uh, temperature times entropy. Now, because we have only an excluded volume interaction, the energy is equal to zero for all the allowed configurations. Okay. The energy is infinite for the configurations that are not allowed, but they don't contribute to the average, right? Only the allowed configurations contribute. Okay. So the energy, this is zero for all allowed configurations, all allowed states of the system. So the only thing that goes into the free energy is the entropy. This then becomes a problem like the crystallization of hard spheres, where also the only thing that goes into the free energy is entropy. Even so, entropy by itself can make a phase transition between an ordered phase and a disordered phase. Okay? Entropy, the entropy associated with the excluded volume is favoring, um, is favoring a parallel alignment between molecules. Right? That if the, if the alignment is parallel, then, um, then there is less excluded volume. So when there's, here, I'll write that out, right? If it's parallel alignment, that means less excluded volume. That means more allowed volume. That is more allowed places where you can put a molecule, like the blue pen. Okay. That means more entropy. That means a lower free energy. Hence, we could expect that um, this uh, excluded volume interaction by itself might be enough to favor nomadic order. Right. Now, that might sound a little bit weird because this is a problem where only entropy is involved. And you might think, well, entropy, that's disorder. So entropy should always favor a disordered structure, right? Well, not exactly, right? It's a little bit more complicated than that, right? In the, um, in the um, nomadic phase, we have um, less orientational entropy, that is, 
there's less disorder in the orientations, but there is more translational entropy, that is more possible positions to put molecules. And so there's a trade-off between the entropy associated with orientations versus the entropy associated with positions. Right? And the entropy associated with positions is enough to favor the pneumatic phase. So that is the basis of Anzager's calculation. Right, so Anzager did a calculation to figure out when is the nomadic phase preferred over the isotropic phase because of these entropic considerations. The answer is it doesn't depend on temperature. And that's because temperature is just a factor out in front of the entropy, right? So temperature affects the free energy in just the same way for the isotropic phase or the pneumatic phase. Okay? Temperature doesn't matter. Instead, the transition depends on uh, concentration. That is the a uh, number of particles per volume. So this is a kind of, of density, but it's not a density of you know, kilograms per volume. It's a density of number of particles per volume. So it has units of one over volume. And uh, Anzager, figured out that the um, we will get an isotropic phase if the concentration C is less than a, a value of 4.25 over DL squared. Okay. So this is something which has units of uh, one over volume. And so here on the right side of this inequality, this has units of one over volume, right? It's uh, a dimensionless number divided by diameter divided by length squared. Right? And it has the combination of DL squared because that's just what we found back here for the excluded volume as a function of angle. So the isotropic phase occurs at low concentration. The pneumatic phase occurs if the concentration is greater than 5.71 over dl squared. Okay. So again, a dimensionless number. Now, you might say, well, what if you have some intermediate concentration between 4.25 and 5.71 uh, d over dl squared? Okay, so um, in the intermediate concentration, you have a two-phase coexistence. So this is like the other problems of two-phase coexistence that we've been talking about in the semester. Right? And so if you have uh, a specified concentration, okay? So, you know, if I, if I um, make up a, a test tube with a certain volume, okay? And into that volume, I put a certain concentration of virus particles. 
which is in between these two numbers, then part of my test tube, part of my sample will be the nematic phase with a high concentration. And part of the sample will be the isotropic phase with a low concentration. And then I could say, well, how much of the sample will be the isotropic phase and how much will be the nematic phase? I could figure that out by solving the four equations in four unknowns, the same as we've done um, for other problems in this semester. Okay? And so we could say there's a coexistence uh, of isotropic with the minimum or with the maximum concentration for isotropic over dl squared and nematic with a concentration of the 5.71 over dl squared. Okay, so um, you know, in some past years, I've given final exam problems where. I tell you the diameter and the length of particles, and I say, what's the overall concentration? And you have to figure out how much nematic phase there is and how much isotropic phase there is by solving the, the four equations and four unknowns. Um, now, it's interesting to see that we have this dependence of the concentration on D and L, the diameter and the length, okay? That's interesting because it, it shows that the transitions occur at a specific volume fraction, okay? So let's think about the volume fraction at the transition. The volume fraction phi, that is the volume that is in rods divided by the total volume. Okay. So that's like the volume fraction that you were calculating when you, we were talking about crystals, right? When we could say, um, you know, in, a, in an FCC crystal, for example, how much of the volume is in spheres versus the, the empty space between spheres. Okay, so let's, let's work this out, okay? The volume uh, that is in rods, this is the number of rods times the volume of one rod, okay, divided by the total volume. Okay, now the number of rods divided by the total volume, that is this thing, that is the concentration. That's exactly what we mean by concentration. Okay. The volume of uh, one rod, uh, let's do another color. The volume of one rod, well, that's the volume of a cylinder. Okay. So the volume of a cylinder, so that's uh, pi, uh, times the radius squared, so d over 2 squared times l. Okay. Um, so uh, that tells us then that phi is the concentration times pi over 4 d squared l. Okay. Now, we know what is the concentration at the transitions, and it's something divided by dl squared, okay? So 
if we combine those expressions, we get an interesting result for what is the volume fraction uh, which gives an isotropic phase or the volume fraction that gives a pneumatic phase. Okay. So we see that um, we have an isotropic phase if the volume fraction is less than um, 3.3 d over l. And then a pneumatic phase, if the volume fraction is greater than 4.5 d over l. Okay. So these are dimensionless numbers, right? D is a length divided by L is a length. So the ratio of those is the aspect ratio of the cylinder. Okay. And of course, it is, um, it is uh, the intermediate case is a two-phase coexistence. Okay, so that tells us then that you know, how easy is it to make a pneumatic phase? That depends on the ratio D over L. Okay. If you have really long, thin objects like, like these cylinders, okay, um, here, uh, you know, D over L is, I don't know, 20 maybe? Uh -huh. Okay, the length is 13, the diameter is one. It's 13 that um, is, is, is L over D, right? So D over L is, is 1 13th, okay? So um, in these kinds of particles, um, the, this is telling us what, uh, volume fraction do you need to get a pneumatic phase, right? If you want a pneumatic phase, you need a volume fraction of 4.5 divided by 13. So that's about one third, okay? Well, that's actually kind of a big volume fraction, okay? Um, what if you had much longer and thinner particles? Like, I don't know, double cylinder, okay? If, if you have a longer, thinner particles, the volume, uh, the, the aspect ratio is 26. Then you could get a pneumatic phase at a lower volume fraction, right? It would be easier to make a pneumatic phase. If the particles were even longer and thinner, right, then, it would be even easier to make a pneumatic phase than that is um, the pneumatic phase would occur at even a lower concentration. So you're, you're, you're more likely to get a pneumatic phase for long thin objects than for short fat objects. Uh, Ibrahim. So why uh, is it mandatory to consider a the shape of these particles inside the solution as a form of roots. What, why is the reason behind this? Why we didn't consider this as spheres or any other uh, any other geometrical shape? Well, um, the many experiments are like that, right? So there there are a lot of you know experiments with particles that are approximately rods, right? So there could be particles which are viruses, there could be particles which are metal cylinders, uh, there could be, um, you know, cellulose has, has lots of organic long thin objects in it, right? And so um, this is a good approximation for many kinds of experiments, right? And these experiments often actually do show pneumatic phases, right? It was a, an experimental discovery that you can get pneumatic phases 
in solutions like that when the particles are very long and thin and rigid. Um, and so um, Anzager developed this theory as uh, a way to understand those experiments. Okay. Um, there are yet other experiments which have, say, polymers that are able to bend. Okay, so they're not perfectly rigid, but you could have a polymer that can bend, but still it has a persistence length, right? It tends to be straight for a certain length and then it will bend. Okay. Um, in that case, the persistence length plays the role of the rod length in these predictions. And that was a, a later um, extension of Anzager's theory. Anzager's theory is from approximately 1948, I think. And you know, there have been many years since then and people have, have worked on further developments of the theory to describe things like uh, semi-flexible polymers that, that can bend. Um, and, um, or, or uh, likewise, in um, the laboratory of Professor Lavrentovich here at Kent State, right, there are um, particles that aggregate to make cylinders. Right? And so there are particles that will self-assemble in solution and they'll make something that's approximately a rod. It's not perfectly rigid, but it's approximately rigid. And so that is described by modifications of Anzager's theory as well. And so, you know, the, the general point to, to take away from this is that um, this is a, a theory for what people call a lyotropic liquid crystal. Lyotropic meaning that you have uh, particles in solution and that the transition uh, depends on concentration. And that is, you know, as opposed to a uh, thermotropic liquid crystal which is a um, a system of molecules where the transition um, depends on temperature because it's that comes from the balance between uh, energy and entropy. Okay. So the Anzager theory is uh, the classic example of a theory for lyotropic liquid crystals. And the um, Myers Alpha theory that we talked about last time is the classic example of a, a theory for thermotropic liquid crystals. The landau degen theory could work for either one because landau degen theory only involves assumptions about order parameters. It completely ignores the idea that the world is made out of molecules or rods or anything else. And so, you know, it is most general, meaning less specific. So we could apply to, to either of these kinds of systems. Okay. But can we consider, can we consider this, uh, this system is more restricted because in comparison with uh, semiconductor, we have like quantum dot to one dimensional structure like wires in like our cases here, like these rods. Mm -hmm. uh, two-dimensional structure. So this study of a uh, degree of freedom will be uh, uh, we will have more than 
degree of freedom for solid state system, but here is only restricted to one di like one dimensional structure. So degree of freedom. Uh, um, well, um, for the for the classic Anzeiger model, um, there's only the concentration degree of freedom, right? Because um, we we have this uh, assumption of rigid rods with only an excluded volume interaction. Um, now, as as I said, there's been a lot of further work on this subject over many years, right? And so um, people could consider, you know, what if there's a little bit of flexibility, right? So what if it's not perfectly rigid? That's one kind of, of modification, right? Or another kind of modification would be, well, what if there is some uh, energy of interaction in addition to the excluded volume? Right? So that would be sort of a combination of Anzager and Myers Alpha theories, right? And so um, you know, there, there has been a lot of progress on this kind of subject over the years. Um, and um, so since you're interested in this, I mean, there's really a lot that you could, you could look up to read on this kind of area. Right? And then, um, you know, people have also worked on technological applications of this sort of thing, right? And so um, once you make uh, a pneumatic phase, right? that is a phase where there is some kind of alignment among all the particles, right? then uh, you, know, you could use that to fabricate structures and you could fabricate structures uh, because you want to control their electronic properties. And so I know you're interested in that kind of thing, for example, yes. right? And so, uh, you know, you could try to uh, fabricate structures that will effectively make wires, right? So big uh, one-dimensional objects, right? And uh, so this, this technique of uh, using a pneumatic liquid crystal as a way to fabricate objects, which you can then remove and use in electronic applications, that's an important research area. Okay. Thank you. So this, this is my third story now about ways to think about the magnitude of pneumatic order, right? And so it's ways to think about the, the transition between the isotropic phase that has zero pneumatic order to the, um, the pneumatic phase, which is non-zero pneumatic order. Right? And um, in, the, in, in both cases, it is a first order transition. And uh, in Myers-Alpha theory, I, I guess I told you last time, it's a transition from S equals zero. And then there's a prediction that S is about 0.43 on the uh, pneumatic side of the transition. Um, in um, Anzager theory, um, there's actually a bigger discontinuity. It goes directly from S equals zero to about S equals 0.84, right? So a bigger change, right? That's the pneumatic phase on the pneumatic side of the transition is even more order. So, um, Either way, right, these are um, theories that address uh, will there be any non-zero pneumatic order? And if so, how much? And either way, you can learn that um, there is a tendency to have a certain specific value of S, the magnitude of pneumatic order. Um, in a pneumatic phase. By comparison, there's a freedom to say which, which way the director will be pointing. I might be pointing in the z direction or the x direction or anywhere in three-dimensional space. 
now, even though the direction is free, still there is a tendency for the direction to be the same everywhere in a sample. Right? There's a tendency, if you have nomadic order pointing this way over here, it'll also point the same way in other places as well. So if the director points in different directions in different places, that could cost extra energy. That then makes the subject of elasticity. Elasticity, it means um, how much free energy is associated with variations, variations of an order parameter. So it could be any kind of order parameter, but here in particular, we're going to concentrate on variations of the director. The simplest example of elasticity that we learned about this semester um, was for the Ising order parameter. All right? So for the Ising model, we have um, an order parameter that is m as a function of position. And then we could say how much free energy is associated with variations of m as a function of position. And back then, several weeks ago, uh, I gave you an argument that the, um, the extra free energy, or that is to say the, the elastic free energy, that will be an extra piece of the free energy density uh, free energy density. That's an extra piece that's plus one half K times the, um, the gradient of M squared. That is the free energy is the free energy with no gradient plus this extra thing. So the total free energy would be an integral uh, dx, dy, dz of the, the usual Landau theory, the one half a prime t minus tc m squared plus fourth b m to the fourth, right, those things, plus this extra elastic piece. And we use this, right? We use this to figure out things like, um, how does m depend on position if you have um, different influences on it? in the bulk versus at the surface. Okay, now let's do that for a pneumatic liquid crystal. In a pneumatic liquid crystal, we have a tensor order parameter. Q alpha beta. Okay. 
In many systems, this tensor order parameter could depend on position, right? It would depend on position. If the molecules are mostly aligned in one direction over here, and they're mostly aligned in some other direction over here, and in between the direction is smoothly changing. All right, so that would be kind of analogous to the, uh, the Ising model, where the magnitude or direction of the order is changing as a function of position. So this thing would then be a tensor field. Now we can write out the free energy in terms of the tensor field. Right? We could say the free energy is our integral of dx dy dz of the, um, the free energy density. The free energy density has one term which looks like something times Q alpha beta, Q alpha beta, which is a function of position. Then it has a term that looks like Q alpha beta, Q beta gamma, Q gamma alpha as a function of position. It has a term that looks like Q alpha beta, Q beta gamma, Q gamma delta, Q delta alpha, right? All of these as functions of position, right? It could have something that looks like uh, the Q alpha beta, Q beta alpha, Q gamma delta, Q delta gamma. Something like that, okay? Um, all these things that we've talked about already. Then, in addition, it can have terms that are associated with derivatives of the Q tensor. What would a term like that look like? Okay, well, once again, we want to say, um, we want to say uh, what is allowed by symmetry. So one kind of term that we could construct that is allowed by symmetry would be, say we could look at Q alpha beta as a function of position, and it could vary as a function of any component of position. It could vary as a function of X or as a function of y, or as a function of z. In general, we could write that as the derivative with respect to coordinate gamma, where gamma equals x, or y, or z. Then, if we want to make a scalar out of this, because the free energy, after all, is a scalar, we could contract this thing with itself. So we could say del, another del gamma of Q alpha beta. Right. This expression is contracted, that it is, it is summed over alpha equals X, Y, and Z, beta equals X, Y, and Z, gamma equals X, Y, and Z. So this is a short way of writing the sum of 27 terms. So that sum can then be multiplied by an elastic coefficient, which people commonly call L uh, in working with this notation. So this term down here, this thing is the simplest version of the elastic free energy 
for a pneumatic liquid crystal. It's, it's not the most detailed version, but it's the simplest version. Okay? And this L would be called an elastic coefficient. Um, let's see. Um, I have one or two more things I need to say about this before I break for the vacation. If any of you need to go, you can come back and watch the, the video, but I'm going to go another 10 minutes or so here. Um, so we're going to say that the, the total free energy that this thing over here, that is the free energy that we've talked about so far, plus this elastic free energy that says, what's the extra free energy that comes from derivatives? Okay. Now, let's suppose we, we believe that expression and now we want to express the free energy in term, excuse me, express the pneumatic order parameter, the tensor, in terms of um, magnitude and direction. So we want to express this tensor in terms of the magnitude S of R and the director N of R. So we know that Q alpha beta as a function of position, well, let me leave out position for the moment. We know that Q alpha beta is S times three halves in alpha in beta minus one half delta alpha beta. We already talked about this when we were thinking of, well, it's just a single tensor everywhere. Right? But if the tensor could be varying as a function of position, then we would say, well, S could be varying as a function of position, and N could be varying as a function of position. So we get this expression for a tensor field. That is a tensor that varies as a function of position. Now, here is where we make a crucial approximation, okay? The approximation is, let's assume that this magnitude is independent of position. Let's assume S of R is just some S independent of position. This is an approximation, but in general, it's an excellent approximation. It's an excellent approximation because um, S is determined by temperature. Uh, it's determined by temperature in a thermotropic liquid crystal, or it's determined by concentration in a lyotropic liquid crystal. But either way, there's something that strongly favors a particular value of S. And 
it's hard to make S be anything different from that value, right? So in general, S is just a function of temperature or concentration. And if the temperature or concentration is the same everywhere in a sample, then S will be approximately the same everywhere in a sample. So in that case, in our excellent approximation, we would say Q alpha beta as a function of position is some constant S times three halves in alpha of R and beta of R minus a half delta alpha beta. Now, let's take this and combine it with the expression for the elastic free energy. The elastic free energy that I showed you uh, a, a few minutes ago is an integral of one half L and then we have this combination of derivatives, del gamma Q alpha beta, del gamma Q alpha beta. I want to take this thing for Q alpha beta and put it in here and here. All right. Let's do it. Right. Um, so we would say, del gamma of Q alpha beta, that is del gamma acting on S times three halves in alpha and beta minus a half delta alpha beta. Now, we're assuming that S doesn't depend on position. So we can factor it out, right? It has no derivative. We'll factor that out. The derivative with respect to coordinate gamma of three halves and alpha and beta minus a half delta alpha beta. Well, the derivative acting on a half delta alpha beta, that's a derivative of a constant, that's zero. So we have the derivative acting on three halves in alpha and beta. Three halves, of course, is a constant, so it factors it out. So it's three halves s, derivative with respect to coordinate gamma of the product in alpha and beta. That I can get from the product rule. Right, the derivative of a product is the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay. So let's put that into the elastic free energy right up there and also there. the elastic free energy is then an integral dx dy dz. Let's see, there's going to be a 3 halves s uh, in alpha del gamma in beta plus in beta del gamma in alpha. And then another copy of that, three halves S and alpha del gamma and beta plus N beta del gamma and alpha. So let's simplify it, okay? We can factor out two factors of three halves S. And I see I've left 
off this uh, one half L also. Sorry about that. One half L is multiplying everything. One half L multiplying everything. Three halves S squared. Integral n alpha del gamma n beta plus n beta del gamma n alpha. Another copy of that. Okay, good so far? All right. So there's this coefficient, a half L times three halves S squared. Integral dx dy dz. Okay, now I need to expand this stuff. Let's first do the first thing times the first thing. Okay, so that's an alpha and alpha del gamma and beta, del gamma and beta. Then the first thing times the second thing, in alpha and beta, del gamma and beta, del gamma and alpha. Then the second times the first, uh, and beta and alpha, del gamma and alpha, del gamma and beta, plus the uh, second times the second, and beta and beta, del gamma and alpha, del gamma and alpha. Okay, so far, All right? can simplify a little bit more. This thing, an alpha and alpha, that's n dot n. Oh, but n is a unit vector, that's one. Similarly, this thing in beta and beta is one. What about the other terms in the middle? For that, I have a really clever trick. Suppose I want to know the derivative of n alpha n alpha. For sure, this is 2 n alpha derivative with respect to gamma of n alpha. But also, this thing is the derivative of one, right? So that's, that's zero, okay? So this clever little trick shows us that this combination of uh, derivatives right here is equal to zero. So um, that is right here and there, those things are zero. So if I put all those pieces together, I get that the elastic free energy is equal to uh, one half L times nine fourths S squared times what? Uh, integral dx dy dz. Um, there is, then these, these two terms are both the same, the remaining two terms, del gamma and alpha, del gamma and alpha. And there's two of them like that. So this then tells us an expression for the elastic free energy associated with changing the director. That is, if the director varies, so we have n 
depends on R. But the magnitude S is constant, then the elastic free energy involves this, um, it's a half something times an integral of all possible derivatives of the director, which all get squared and added up. Right? So this thing is the derivative of an x with respect to x squared, plus the derivative of n y with respect to x squared, plus you know, all the other ways that you can take derivatives, right? It's a sum of nine terms. All added up times some coefficient. People generally call this coefficient k. That is a word for what they might call a frame constant or an elastic constant. And so here we are relating that to the elastic constant for the, um, for the Q tensor, right? So we're saying that K is uh, what we figured out uh, down here, right? So it is uh, nine halves L S squared. Okay. So this thing that I'm so excited about deriving that I just keep talking and talking, um, this thing is um, our um, simplest version of the Frank elastic free energy. It is the simplest version, okay? It is showing us that variations of the director cost energy and they cost energy proportional to the square of these derivatives. This is a very good start for describing the elasticity of pneumatic liquid crystals. It is a very good start, but it is not an end, right? Something like this, you know, is, is not good enough to describe the liquid crystals inside you know, a laptop display in you know, the, the newest MacBook or whatever. Um, it is not good enough because liquid crystals are more anisotropic than that. That is um, different kinds of derivatives actually cost different amounts of free energy. They don't all cost the same amount of free energy. That is a subject that I want to talk about after the vacation. I have recently written an article about my way of thinking about this kind of variation. I have now put this article in the Blackboard and I would like you to please read it. Let me show you what article I am speaking about. I will say it is this article right here. That is now uploaded in the Blackboard and I want to present this version of the story because it's a little bit different from the standard version that you might have gotten in other classes, right? If other classes have already taught you about things like splay and twist and bend, um, I'm presenting my version of the story here because ha ha ha, my version is better. Ha ha ha, right? I say so modestly. Um, so I would like you to read my version and um, read it 
uh, you know, over the holiday, and um, then um, you can think about how that compares with other versions that you might have heard. Um, and then we can talk about it after the Thanksgiving vacation. I will stop talking here. I know I've gone way over time. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for sticking around. Um, have a great vacation, you guys. And I will see you um, a week from Monday then. All right, but I'll answer any questions for now. Thanks, uh, goodbye. I have, a, I have several questions. Uh, at first, could you please go, go back to, the, um, to, your, to your good notes? and yes. uh, to the page where you showed us the total free energy of the liquid system. Yes. So about the uh, full free energy. Um, uh, that's this one, right? All right, mm -hmm. this one. So for the quartic terms, you have two quartic terms here, right? But actually, I don't usually use the first term in the um, in the quartic terms. I know when the liquid crystal is uniaxial, it doesn't matter whether we put um, one or two terms in the quartic um, in this quartic um, form because the two uh, because these two terms. Um, would would depend only on s, right? Uh, and um, yes. the coefficients of these two terms would add up together to be one. So when the liquid crystal is uniaxial, it doesn't matter whether we distinguish these two terms or not. But when the liquid crystal is biaxial, we might need to consider the further term in the quadratic terms, right? Uh, is this? I, I, I think no. Um, yeah, you are correct about a point that I have been sort of glossing over, okay? And the point is that um, these, these two uh, expressions, right? So, so um, this thing and this thing, they, they look different from each other. And in general dimensionality, they are different from each other. Right? If I were doing this calculation in six dimensional space or something like that, they are different from each other. Um, however, um, in, in three dimensional space, they are actually equal to each other except for something trivial, like a factor of two. I don't remember exactly. So in three-dimensional space, which of course is what we care about, um, there is no need to distinguish these two things, right? And um, that is not obvious, but there is a mathematical proof of that. And um, I'm sure we could figure out how to prove that. Um, so, um, in, in fact, um, in fact, it's unnecessary for me to be writing both of these things. Okay. So, so why, why did I do this unnecessary thing? Well, because I thought it was easier just to write it than to explain why not to write it. Um, so, um, um, but, but in fact, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, it doesn't do any harm, but it doesn't matter. In, in three dimensions. Okay. In, okay. In, in higher dimensions, it would matter, but in three dimensions, it does not. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. could, could you please go back to the page where you showed us the scalar order parameter for the Onsager theory, uh, S is equal to maybe 0.9, oh, okay, 0.84. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does this scalar order parameter depend on the aspect ratio of the molecules? No, no. Well, intuitively, I think it will. Well, this is the scalar parameter, order parameter, right on the nomadic side of the transition. Okay, so the where the nomadic 
side of the transition is depends on the aspect ratio of the molecules. Okay, so so um, the aspect ratio you know, determines the phase boundary, mm -hmm. right? but right at the phase boundary, that is when phi equals this thing, the pneumatic phase has the order parameter of the point eight four. Okay, um, but you know if if you compare different aspect ratios at the same volume fraction, they're not both up to, right at the phase transition, right? One might be at the phase transition and the other might be deep inside the pneumatic phase. Is there any simple interpretation why um, the, the scalar or the parameter um, for the Onsager theory is larger than the uh, scalar order parameter from the mayer zalp theory? That's a really interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of the answer for that. Um, okay, it's fine. Um, you know, in, in some sense, you could say that the, the meyer alpha potential is is a smoother kind of potential, right? The the s squared potential, or the um, you know a cosine squared of theta sort of potential. Um, it it depends on theta more softly, right? Whereas the the Anzager potential uh, like this. Has a, has a sharper dependence on theta, right? It more strongly favors a specific exact alignment of theta. So maybe that's a rough way of saying that um, it should favor really strong pneumatic order. Um, but that's really hand-waving right now. I'm not sure that's a, that's a great answer. Um, I'm sure there must be work over many years. That, that, oh, okay. That, Thank I'm you. Not, Thank you. Uh -huh. Great question. Uh -huh. So for this uh, V excluded, uh, well, you only showed us the um, the excluded volume in Onsager theory, right? But there, there is also rotational degrees of freedom inside this system. But uh, I mean that. The transition between the isotropic phase and the pneumatic phase is a competition between the uh, the positional entropy and the translate uh, and the rotational entropy, right? But here, the V excluded is only associated with the um, positional entropy, but not the position, uh, but not the rotational entropy. So. Is there a form for the um, for for V rotation something like that? Well, I I think the way Anzager did it was to have an orientational distribution function, um, and then the uh, the entropy comes from the integral of uh, of rho log. Right? So it's the same kind of uh, information theory style expression that we talked about um, in the context of Myers Alpha theory. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry mm -hmm. about the noise. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, so if it were only translational entropy, then you would only have a pneumatic phase, right? Because the, the translational entropy all, always favors the pneumatic. Uh, and the um, by comparison, the uh, orientational entropy favors the isotropic, uh, and so it's it's the competition between those two things that gives an isotropic pneumatic transition. <laughs>